Okay, today once again we're going to be talking about the force on a charged particle when it is moving through a magnetic field. Now you might say this is part two because we're going to kind of go a little further here with part two than we did in part one where we just talked about the direction of the force. And this is what we're going to be talking about in this video. Okay, now we have a charged particle. It's a positively charged particle right here. It's moving with this velocity and here is our magnetic field. This is the area of our magnetic field as a merit and there is a magnetic field and as you can see the magnetic is field is moving into the page. Those X's and those circles mean the magnetic field is moving into the page. Now we want to know what happens to that charged particle when it enters that magnetic field. Okay, right here there is no magnetic field and you can see that it's going to just charge straight through until it enters that magnetic field. Now, in the previous videos, we've talked about what's the force, how we determine the direction of the force. And what we do is we take our right hand and we place our thumb in the direction of the motion of the particle, which is to the right, that's my right. The magnetic field is into the page. So you take your right hand, you turn it like this. Okay, your fingers point into the page, your fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field, thumb in the direction of motion of the particle, and then your palm shows you the direction of the force. So we would say that the force is up. Okay, and that's kind of what we have did in maybe part one. I didn't actually call it part one, but we said, okay, now the direction is up. Okay, and then we just dropped it from there. But what actually happens is the particle continues in that magnetic field, and because it's moving in this direction with this velocity, and it feels the force in this direction, and now it's going to move on a curved path. So now it's in the magnetic field, and it's going to constantly feel that magnetic force, okay, that Lorentz force on that charged particle due to that magnetic field, because it's still in the magnetic field, okay, and it still feels that force. So now it's here, Okay, and it's still, now it's traveling in this direction, thumb in the direction, okay, magnetic field is still in, magnetic field is still into the page, and that means the force is now this way, kind of up to the uh, left and up, all right? So now we feel the force that way. Now it's going to continue feeling that force, and then it's going to come over here, and we have it like this, okay, the particle is moving kind of up to the left, and then the magnetic field in the page, and now the force is kind of down to the left like that. And then finally, it reaches the edge of the magnetic field. It still feels a force to the down like that. And then it leaves the magnetic field, and then it just flies straight away because now there's no more force on it. Okay, its velocity here is um, to the left, and there's no force on it from the magnetic field, so it just continues in this direction. It's not going to accelerate anymore. Okay, now you'll notice that it follows this path, and you should notice that all of these force arrows point to this point, which is right here. There you go. It picked it right there. And that point is the center of the curvature. Okay, the curvature is that curved path, that circular path that that particle is following. And the distance, obviously, from that point out to the edge of that curved path, that circular path, is going to be the radius of that circle. So the particle actually feels a force when it enters that magnetic field, and then it travels on a circular path. It's not parabolic or something else like that elliptical. It's actually a circular path and it ends up right here and then it goes out again. And often what we want to know is what are the factors that affect the radius of that circle or the size of the circle. And really if you think about it, think about it, you could stop the video if you wanted to and think about it for a second. There are, let's see, four things. There's the velocity of the particle. There's the strength of the magnetic field B. There's the mass of the particle. And there's the charge of the particle. And it's interesting to think about, well, how do each of these factors, the velocity of the particle, the magnetic field strength, the mass of the particle, and the charge on the particle, how would they affect how big? What would cause the path to be larger, the circle, the circle to be larger, the radius of that path to be larger, and what would cause it to be smaller? Well, let's go through each of these things, and you can just kind of think about, well, what, what would happen? And a lot of this should just make sense from mechanics, okay? If you have something that's moving really quickly, then it's harder. It has more momentum, more inertia. Okay, it's harder to change its velocity. It's harder to change its direction of motion. So we would say that the radius of that path is directly proportional to the velocity. The higher the velocity, the larger the radius. Now, it's moving and curving because there, there is a force because it, there is the magnetic field. So you might think, well, if their magnetic field is stronger, that's what's causing it to turn in a sense. Okay, that's, what's, that's what's applying the force. So therefore, 
we could say that the radius and the magnetic field strength are inversely proportional to each other. So the radius is inversely proportional. That means as the magnetic field strength gets greater, then the radius is going to get smaller. If we decrease the magnetic field strength, you make it close to zero, there's, there's barely enough force that's going to have a really big radius, a large radius. Okay, now once again, what about the mass? Well, the mass is just, it's just a bigger thing. It's not a bigger thing. It's a more massive thing. It has more inertia. It's harder to change its path. So the more the mass, the greater the radius. Okay, and the last thing is the charge. Well, you can kind of think, well, the charge is kind of interacting. It's the charge, I, you can think of it, the charge as interacting the, from that with, that with the magnetic field. So the higher the charge, the more charge, the, the, uh, the smaller the radius is going to be. So therefore, the radius and the, and the charge are inversely proportional. Like we increase the charge on that particle, because it's a charged particle, a positively charged particle, then the radius is going to be smaller. Okay, now if we put all that together, you can think about, well, if we put all together, what would the equation look like that would describe the radius in terms of these four factors? Well, two are directly proportional and two are inversely proportional, so that means that the radius is going to be directly proportional, because on the top half of that fraction, the mass and the velocity, and inversely proportional to the charge and the magnetic field. Okay, so that's the equation we use to calculate the radius. Now, we could actually do that in a little bit more systematic, mathematical, scientific way because we know that we, we take Newton's second law, we can apply Newton's second law to this situation. We have the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, and this is the centripetal force. This is the mass, and this is centripetal acceleration because when things move on a curved path, then the, uh, the acceleration is v squared over r. So all I did was I rewrote, rewrote this equation, and we know the force. There's only one force. It's the Lorentz force. Okay, the force from the magnetic field, which we can calculate that force, the amount of force as the charge times the velocity times the magnetic field strength, QVB. And that's going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration, right? Force is equal to net force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass is m, and the acceleration for an object that's traveling on a curved path, the acceleration is v squared over r. Okay, now we, we, can, we could solve this equation for any of factor, Q, V, B, whatever, but as we did in the previous slide, we'll solve it for R. And um, what did we do here? Oh, yes, we said that, that we know this velocity and these velocities are the same, so we can cancel this velocity with one of these two. So now we have Q and B, and now we can solve for R, and then we just switch those two with the R. And the R goes on the top, and the M and the V are on the bottom, and then the Q, Q the M and the V are on the top, and the charge and the magnetic field. So that's the same equation we have. That's the exact same equation we had in the, on the previous slide. Just another way to kind of derive that equation from uh, Newton's second law. Okay, so there we go. Now let's actually do a problem really quick. I think that's what we're going to do on the next slide. We're going to do a problem really quick. Here's our diagram we had in the previous slide. Here's the equation we set. And we have a, ch a char, a particle that has a positive charge of minus, um, not minus, because when that's not positive, positive is positive, minus is minus, has a charge of 5 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. It's moving with a velocity of 1 times 10 to the third meters per second. It has a mass of 2 times 10 to the minus 19 kilograms, remember it has to be in kilograms, and the magnetic field strength we just said is two, 0.20 teslas. Okay, so um, then we just plug the values in. It's not that complicated, obviously. Uh, we just plug those values in, mass and velocity on the top, charge and the magnetic field strength on the bottom, and we get that the radius of that path of that charged particle um, would be uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, which is a little bit better to say, maybe 2 centimeters, okay? Now, one thing you can think of, of course, if you change the, 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 the charge from a positive to a negative, then obviously uh, the path would just be moving in the opposite direction. Okay, it would just be this way, but the radius would still be the same. Okay, so I think that was all we're going to do in that video. That is kind of the beginning of how a, uh, basically, you know, how, a, um, what's that thing called? A mass spectrometer works. And maybe in the next video or something like that, we'll do a problem using, uh, talking about mass spectrometry and how we determine uh, the mass of a particle using a mass spectrometer. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope you found the video helpful. If you did, please do all the following four things. Subscribe to my channel. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Leave a nice positive comment in the comment section below. And don't forget, sharing is caring. Share this video with all of your friends. Show them how much you care. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.